What's up guys, in this video I'm covering understanding over squashing and bottlenecks on graphs via curvature paper by Jake Topping, Francesco Di Giovanni, Benjamin Chamberlain, Xiao Wen Dong and Michael Bronstein. So before we even start, I guess it will only make sense for me to explain to you what over, squash over squashing uh, exactly means, what are bottlenecks and finally what is curvature. So let's see this sentence in, in the abstract that connects these, these concepts and then I'm gonna give you an explanation of what those exactly are. So we provide a precise description of the over squashing phenomena in graph neural networks and analyze how it arises from bottlenecks in the graph. For this purpose, we introduce a new uh, edge-based combinatorial curvature and prove that negatively curved edges are responsible for the over-squashing issue. So negatively curved edges, whatever that means, I'm gonna explain that briefly, uh, are responsible for the over-squashing issue. Okay, so let me first start with the preliminaries. So let's first see what this bottleneck thing is in graph neural networks and what uh, over-squashing is, which is a very connected phenomenon. So you may be familiar with the RNNs, so recurrent neural networks, and you may know that we have this uh, squashing phenomenon occurring in RNNs as well. So, uh, so this is uh, just a, a rolled out version of an RNN model, and you can see that so some information, some input is fed into the RNN here, and then this information is passed on to the next step here, where we have another piece of information mixing together with this previous step. And then in the third step, we'll be, we'll be having this additional information mixing with the information from the previous two steps. And so as you can imagine, so already here, the, like the, this, this information from, from the first step constitutes only like maybe roughly one third of the informational content uh, that, you can be, that can be find, found in this particular uh, time step of RNN. And so the more we go towards right, the, the, this, this information from this step constitutes a minor and minor percentage of the informational content of that fixed size vector. And uh, basically that's what bottleneck is all about. So as you can see here, because we have this uh, bottleneck where all of these informations have to pass and be squeezed inside of this fixed size vector, uh, so that bottleneck uh, causes the over squashing of information. So that's how these two concepts are related. Okay, so we know that RNNs were susceptible to this particular problem, and we know that later some models such as LSTMs or GRUs um, managed to uh, basically uh, focus on, on, on some parts of the information more, on some parts of the, on, of the information less, and uh, thus they managed to, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, avoid this bottleneck problem, but not completely. Uh, well, with graph neural networks, the problem is even more severe, and the reason can be seen in this example here. So you can see that, uh, like, compared to RNNs, we have exponentially uh, more uh, informational vectors coming in in every single step. So because of how the spatial uh, GNNs work, and that's by basically aggregating uh, one hop neighborhood, uh, that's how usually GNNs are implemented. So because of that, if you had uh, a graph such as maybe, let me just draw some examples. So if you have a graph like this, where this node is connected to two more nodes, and then these two nodes are connected to two more nodes, uh, so, so like this. So then if you were to start calculating features for this one, so in the first step you'd be including, so let me just draw this. So you'd, you'd include information from these two, and these two would include information from these two, which means that the information from this vector here, from this node here, will in the first step propagate here, and then in the second step it will propagate all the way here. And that's what we can see visually on this graph exactly. So basically for topologies such as this one, where we have with every, where every node will have two additional neighbors, uh, we'll basically have exponential grow, uh, gr growth of, of um, information content that we need to squeeze in ultimately into, into a fixed size representation of this particular node here. So that's the, uh, that's the bottleneck and over squashing problem. And it's, as you can see, uh, intimately related to the topology of a particular graph uh, you're dealing with. Okay, 
Uh, next up, second concept that I want to explain before we start uh, analyzing the paper, and that's the curvature. So um, let me read this this uh, statement here. So Ricci curvature of a manifold can be characterized by geodesic dispersion, i.e. whether two parallel geodesics shot from nearby points converge, which happens in a positively curved spaces locally resembling a sphere, such as this example here, or they remain parallel, in the flat or Euclidean case, as you can see here, or they diverge, negative curvature giving rise to hyperbolic geometry. So most of you are probably just familiar with Euclidean geometry, but like back in, I think, 19th century already, uh, people such as Riemann and, and, um, and others started devising these other types of geometry. So you can see here that if you were to shot like two parallel lines, so two geodesics, where geodesic is just a fancy name of saying uh, like basically the shortest path on a particular geometry, which in the case of a Euclidean plane will, will be like a, like a straight line, but in the case of like a sphere or hyper, uh, hyperbolic uh, type of surfaces, uh, it's not going to be a straight line. So you can see here if you sh shoot two hyper uh, two geodesics, they're going to ultimately converge here on the North Pole. And that's why, so when the lines convert, when the geodesics converge, uh, that space is basically uh, described as being uh, positively curved. Uh, here you can see that these geodesics are gonna, let me just take a pen here. So they are going to diverge. So this is going to track this line here and this geodesic is gonna be tracking this line here. So you can see they, they are diverging and because of that, this hyperbolic space has negative curvature, okay? So this is also, so this Ricci curvature basically is a scalar that tells you whether the space is positively curved uh, in the case of a sphere or zero or negatively curved in, a, in, in, in the case of this uh, particular uh, geometric object here. Okay, so aside from the Ricci curvature, we need to know a couple more concepts and the main one will be Ricci flow, uh, which basically tells you the rate of change of a metric tensor uh, is directly proportional to the Ricci curvature. Now that might, may seem uh, and sound very complex because it probably is, but I'm gonna sh show you a short video that's gonna give you like all the necessary uh, intuition that you need to have uh, before uh, proceeding with this paper. So. Uh, just as a trivia, I want to mention a couple of people here. So this guy here called uh, Gregorio Ricci uh, Curbastro uh, was the guy who invented the Ricci curvature and after whom the Ricci curvature was named. Uh, this is Hamilton who uh, discovered the Ricci flow uh, equation. And finally, this is Gregory Perelman, uh, a guy who managed to solve the famous millennium uh, problem in mathematics called the Poincaré uh, conjecture. And he solved it using basically uh, building on top of Hamilton's work. Uh, and he used Ricci flow to solve this uh, Poincaré conjecture. Also, as a fun fact, he decided to uh, basically decline both the Fields Medal, which is an equivalent of a Nobel Prize in, in uh, mathematics, as well as the Millennium Prize, like a $1 million prize for solving one of these seven uh, Millennium problems uh, as proposed by the Clay Institute. So Poincaré conjecture was one of that, those. Okay, so uh, now check out this video uh, where you'll understand what Ricci flow is all about, and then we'll continue. Ricci flow is a way of changing the metric tensor over time so that the manifold becomes rounder. So how do we express Ricci flow concretely? I want you to focus on this region over here. The Ricci flow inflates it like a balloon. By convention, we say that it has negative Ricci curvature. So if the curvature is negative, the length increases. Now focus on this region here. Ricci flow deflates it. So if the Ricci curvature is positive, the length decreases. We can phrase this differently. G decreases means the derivative of G is negative. G increases just means the derivative of G is positive. These two guys always have opposite signs. So we might guess an equation like this. And that's it. That is the equation describing Ricci flow. 
Okay, cool. So I strongly suggest you go ahead and uh, watch the whole video as it's super informative. And but this this clip I, I just showed you is enough for you to understand the paper. So we can continue. Cool. So uh, as you just saw, uh, we have Ricci flow is basically this differential equation connecting metric tensor with Ricci curvature. And you can see so in the example of a body you can see here on the screen, we have that this we see that this part has very negative curvature, which is denoted by this blue color. And uh, by, by, by applying Ricci flow because of the negative, uh, like negative value of the curvature, that part is going to be inflated, whereas this part, which, which has uh, like positive curvature, is going to be deflated, basically. And we end up with something like this. So we can see that Ricci flow in this continue, on this continuous manifold can reduce these bottlenecks. And now let's just translate this idea onto the discrete case, which are the graphs. And we can see that intuitively what happens is a, is a similar thing. So we can see we have a bottleneck here. So let me just change the color. So we see a bottleneck here, which is denoted again by a blue edge. And by inflating that space by adding uh, edges here, uh, basically we are making this part of the space more positive. And we are also, uh, they are also removing some of the edges here, which means we'll have less edges here. And then the statistics of the graph stays roughly the same, uh, but like with reduced bottleneck. And you can see that the colors are homo homogenized, meaning that this became more reddish. And this part that was super red now became uh, also has some blue uh, colors to it. So that's that's what we we managed to accomplish a similar thing to this uh, analogous thing to this what happened in the continuous space. Uh, cool. So now let me just show you some preliminaries and then we'll 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 uh, see how they formalize the notion of over squashing and then we'll see how they formalize the notion of negative curvature on graphs and finally how they connect the two so that they can devise an algorithm where they'll be picking these negative edges and rewiring the graph to get uh, uh, less problems with over squashing uh, so um, let's see some piece of notation here first this s sub r of i is basically the 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 neighborhood. Uh, so it's it's a set of these j's of nodes j's uh, that belong to the set of all nodes uh, denoted as v uh, that have this geodesic distance between i and j that's precisely equal to r. So it's a fancy way of saying this is a set of nodes j which are exactly r hops away from node i. Okay, uh, and then this uh, b sub r of i is the same thing, but here we have like a smaller or equal, which means we'll be including all of the intermediate uh, intermediate nodes, and thus this is uh, like a receptive field of this particular uh, node. Okay, just to visualize the notation, it's gonna be probably a bit easier. So if this node two here is our node i, then the S1 neighborhood of i is basically nodes three and nodes one. Uh, then the, the, the S2 neighborhood, so if we were to draw S2 neighborhood of I, that's going to be nodes zero and four. As you can see, we need exactly the shortest path takes two uh, edges to get to node zero and the same for node four. Uh, finally, the, the B neighborhood, so let's say we have uh, neighborhood B2 of I is going to encompass all of these nodes we saw. So that's going to be B2. Uh, and let me just check whether in the, I think it also includes, yeah, it also includes node 2 as well. So this every, all of these nodes are now going to be B2 neighborhood of I. And just an additional detail, I assume B stands for ball and S stands for surface, which makes intuitive sense. As you can see here, we can include the whole volume, all of these nodes, whereas in S we just take the front. So we basically ignore all of, all of these uh, inner uh, nodes inside of the S sets. Uh, cool. So next up, uh, just a short mention of message passing neural networks. And if you're not familiar with graph neural networks, I have a whole playlist. I'm going to link it somewhere here. You can check it out. I'm going to just briefly uh, recap what this is all about. Uh, and you can see that in order to calculate the features of a node i uh, in layer L plus uh, one, what we do is the following. So we take the previous feature of that node i, so in the previous layer, a layer L, and we basically combine it, so maybe concatenation, with this expression here, and then we, we apply this function that's called the update function phi, okay? So let me just uh, now decouple what this term is all about. So you can see we have a 
sum uh, j goes from 1 to through n, uh, which is basically n is the, the cardinality of the uh, node set. So that means there's a fancy way of saying it's the number of nodes in your graph. Uh, a hat ij is basically your adjacency matrix, so the connectivity matrix, but this is with additional twist. They added self edges, and that means basically every node will have additionally uh, implied edge like this. Although if it's undirect, it's gonna be uh, like both directions basically. So every node will have this self edge. And plus they also have normalization using these D matrices, which are uh, basically your, um, what well, yeah, degree matrices. And this just normalizes the adjacency, the augmented adjacency matrix uh, A tilde. Uh, so what this will effectively do is filter out, so this is going to be um, non-zero only for immediate nodes of node i. So that means we're just going to look at the one hop neighborhood of node i and uh, otherwise this will be zero and thus we won't care about this thing. Uh, whereas this is just your message passing function psi and these are the representations of node i and its neighbors node j. Uh, so let me just show you a diagram to make it a bit uh, easier. So that means we're going to take a look at the one hop neighbors of node uh, h uh, of node one and we're going to aggregate somehow combine the, this feature with this feature using some uh, function psi which is usually like MLP like a multi-layer perception. We're going to form representations in such a way which are called messages and then we're going to aggregate them uh, like this. So in this particular case, they, they've chosen a, a particular uh, permutation invariant function uh, I sum in this particular case, but in general it can be uh, whatever, like whatever function that's, that's permutation invariant, like maybe uh, like uh, average or, or even uh, a max a function is permutation invariant. And so people usually denote that, you'll probably see that in the literature as like O plus, uh, which is a general a generic permutation invariant operator instead of using sum. So that's some uh, preliminaries, uh, the notation and, uh, and uh, gr these generic message passing neural networks. And now let me show you how they formalize the concept of oversquashing. Uh, but before that, why do we care? Like, well, the reason we care is because as we saw, as soon as we ha have long dependencies, the information is gonna be over squashed and thus uh, the two remote nodes cannot communicate effectively with each, with, with each other. And so they say here, we say that a graph learning problem has long range dependencies when the output of a MPNN depends on representations of distant nodes interacting with each other. And so in these types of graphs where, which are called heterophilic, uh, com as compared to homophilic, uh, you basically want to have this uh, remote communication going on if you want to have accurate predictions. And so that's why we need to solve the oversquashing problem if we are to be performant on these heterophilic types of graphs. So let me show you how they formalize this, this notion of oversquashing. Okay, let's first, uh, let me show you the, the notation here before I start parsing the equation, uh, the inequality. So what they have is the following. So they have nodes i and s, from the set of nodes V, such that S belongs to the set S sub R plus one of I, which means uh, S is R plus one uh, hops away from node I. So that's something like this. So maybe we have a node I here, and then we have a bunch of nodes here, bunch of nodes, and then somewhere here we have node S, and this shortest path to get from, from uh, basically I to S is equal to R plus one. So let me just draw that. So that's R plus one length, okay? So we have node S here and node I here. And uh, basically then they say if, the, if you can uh, bound the gradient of the phi and psi functions, which are the message and, uh, and update functions, uh, basically if you can bound them by some, some, some scalars alpha and beta, uh, then uh, they show that this here, this expression here holds. And this, what this tells us is the following. So the sensitivity of this um, representation of node i in layer r plus one uh, and sensitivity with respect to uh, node s, so to the raw features of node s is upper bounded. So we take the absolute value of this, of this uh, derivative here, and we can see it's bounded by alpha beta raised to the power of r plus one times 
a hat raised to the power of r plus one and then we just take the uh, index by i and s. Okay, so there is a couple of things worth mentioning here. First of all, if you're not familiar with taking powers of these adjacency matrices, there is a special semantics behind uh, a raised to the power r plus one. Namely, if you index this matrix here with i s, you'll get the number of shortest paths between i nodes i and nodes s which makes intuitive sense. So basically the more such paths we had, that means that S, so the features from, from, from the information from node S had multiple paths by which they could reach node I, and thus you can intuitively understand that that means that this upper bound is gonna become bigger because the, and the over squashing will, will be uh, like uh, less um, prominent. That's observation number one. Observation number two here is the following. So you do have to have, uh, you do have to, to observe the representation of node i uh, only uh, after applying r plus one uh, layers of, of your graph neural network. The reason is underreaching. If you were to just apply, let's say, if, if like less than r plus one, then this information from node s would have not reached node i yet. So that means maybe the information from, from this node uh, s only have has reached until here. And that means that this is going to be uh, zero because like there is no influence of hs of the, of the raw vector of node s uh, on the representation because the, the, the information still hasn't propagated to node i. So that's something to keep in mind. So that means that here you, you have to have r plus one because then you're basically uh, calculating non-zero sensitivity of node i and how the information from s influences node i. So I think that's that's pretty much everything you need to understand about, about this formula. So it's a nice way of connecting oversmoothing on one hand with topological uh, topology of your uh, graph on the other hand. Okay, so as an example they show here, for example, if the uh, shortest uh, path between i and s is r plus one and the subgraph induced on, on this uh, uh, B set is a binary tree, uh, then this adjacency matrix, uh, like indexed at IS, is going to have this particular shape. And what's interesting here is that as R grows, which means as you're looking at, at further away nodes, you're going to have exponential decrease of this term, which means in turn that you're going to have small, this will be exponentially decreasing and thus the sensitivity will be exponentially decreasing, which means that the over squashing will become more and more prominent. Okay, now let's continue. So let me show you now how they formalize, how they calculate the curvature of a graph. That may be uh, unintuitive to some of you, as well as to me uh, on the first pass of reading this paper. Uh, okay, so we saw how the how these um, curved spaces look like when they are continuous. Now let's see how this thing works for discrete case, i.e. for graphs. So uh, intuitively, the, the, the notion is the following. So if you take these two nodes, P and Q, and you take two edges, you'll see that in graphs such as this one, they'll tend to converge to this node K and thus form a triangle. And basically triangles will be a feature that indicates that the space is positively curved in graphs. On the other hand, if you take two edges and they uh, stay on the same uh, distance, uh, then, and they form four cycle by doing so, then th this space is gonna be uh, classified as having zero curvature. And finally, if we have uh, edges that start diverging, uh, then in that case, the space is negative. Now, this is kind of hand wavy because unless you attach geometric uh, like information to these edges, like the fact we just chosen to draw the graph like this doesn't mean anything. But like you can imagine that also, like you can see here that the path between this node and this node starts becoming larger and larger, whereas here it's like zero and here it stays constant. So that's maybe a better way to, to think about this. But like just visually as well, you can see that these two kind of converge, these two stay parallel and these two diverge. This is probably, yeah, probably better to explain it like this. Okay, so now intuitively what this curvature uh, calculation needs to do is count these topological elements and by counting them uh, decide on the actual curvature of an edge. So let's see how they uh, choose to do that. 
So first worth mentioning, there are two discrete variants of calculating Ricci curvature for graphs. One is known as the Olivier curvature, denoted as this as italic uh, weird font K symbol. Uh, and we also have this Froman, uh, Foreman curvature, uh, denoted as big F here. So they, uh, there are trade-offs between these two curvature. Olivier is much more expressive, but much more computationally expensive. Uh, Foreman has the uh, opposite properties. Basically, it's much more uh, efficient computationally, but it's not as expressive as Olivier's curvature. Um, what they've done is they've, they've taken the Foreman curvature and they've upgraded it to this balanced Foreman curvature. And in order to understand the equation, let me first break down a couple of, of, of sets we'll need to take care about. So the first set is this one, which basically tells you the number of triangles that are formed uh, on this edge ij. And you can formally uh, basically calculate that by finding an intersection between S1 sets of node i and node j. So these are the triangles that are based at the edge ij. So let me show you an example. So if we have here this, this particular graph, and let me just, okay, so basically if this is node i here, and this is node j, we find the, uh, we find the S1 sets first. So for uh, node i, so S1 of i is gonna be this. It's gonna be this element here, because you can see there is, the distance is just one, this one, this one and this one as well as j so this is the s1 set uh, on the other hand if we want to calculate s1 set for j that's going to be five six and zero and what they do is they find an intersection and you can see that the only intersection we have in this particular example is node six so this one here and as you can see it does form a triangle and that's the only triangle we have in this particular graph Okay, so that's the first thing we need to care about, triangles. The second thing we need to care about is these four cycles. And you can see here a formulaic description. I'm gonna just uh, read you the, what it represents. And that's that these are the neighbors of phi forming a four cycle based at the edge ij without the diagonals inside. Okay, so basically let me again show you this. Uh, for node i, the four cycles are gonna be, so that those are gonna be two and three. Uh, because you can see here we have a four cycle here going from i to j and then back. So it's a four cycle. We have a second four cycle going over three, as you can see here, going to j and backwards. So those are four cycles. And uh, you may wonder why have I excluded four from, the, from this set? And the reason is because we have this diagonal here. And that's why we will not include uh, number four uh, node 4 into this set of four cycles of node i. Okay, now let me try and connect that with the formula uh, just for fun. So you can see here uh, what the formula states and let's check whether uh, this, this um, why the node 4 basically will not belong to, to a set. So we can see that the, this set of four cycles for node i is uh, a set of these k's such that k is basically uh, belongs to S1 set of node i, but does not belong to S1 set of j, neither can k be equal to j. Okay, let me now just delete this to, to make this clearer. So let me delete everything here and let me uh, basically show you how this is gonna function. So k belongs to S1 of i. So that means k is one of these elements here, okay? It's gonna be one of those elements here uh, and then we exclude, uh, basically we exclude uh, J, which means we exclude this one, and we also exclude everything that belongs to node to S1 set of J. So that means we're gonna exclude this one as well. So we, are, we end up with two, three, and four. And we already saw that two and three do satisfy all of the conditions, and that, thus we included those in this set, but we, we, for some reason we did not include number four. And the reason is because of this other condition. Uh, so that K needs to be such that there exists this node W that belongs, so that means that this set here is uh, non-zero, not, not empty set. So you can see that S1 of K, so let's, let's find S1 of K. So K is four in our example. So this is our K, this is our potential candidate at this point of time. 
So this is these are the uh, S1. This is the S1 neighborhood of, of K, and intersection with S1 of J is going to be just this node here. So this is going to be the intersection. But at the same time, we need to find something that does not belong to S1. And because this thing belongs to S1, that's why we have to digit again. And that's a very complicated way of telling you that, hey, if we have a diagonal here, we cannot count in this four cycle. That's the whole point. Finally, I'm going to skip this one. Um, basically, a gamma max tells you the number of these um, degenerate cycles, i.e. cycles that, that pass uh, over a common node. And for this particular graph, it's going to be two. And that's because you can see that two cycles, two, four cycles are passing over this node five here. And that's why this gamma is going to be uh, two for this particular uh, example. Okay, so enough rambling. Uh, let's uh, see the formula. So first, in line with the discussion uh, about geodesic dispersion, one expects the number of triangles to be related to positive curvature, complete graph, number of four cycles to zero curvature, grid, and the remaining outgoing edges to negative curvature, tree. Our new curvature formulation reflects such an intuition. And here is finally the formula. So you can see the Ricci curvature, so the balance form and curvature implementation of the Ricci curvature has this very, very, uh, like, uh, detailed uh, shape and so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to explain every single uh, detail but you can understand basically that it, it sums you can see here we have a sum of triangles uh, which is gonna uh, contribute to the positive value of this curvature and everything is normalized by the degrees of nodes i and j uh, and a fun property that emerges from this is because we have this minus two is that the curvature is always gonna be bigger than minus two. So that's, uh, and I think it's also upper bounded because of the normalization by one. Uh, but don't quote me on that one. Okay, cool. So now let's see a couple of very interesting uh, theorems that are going to connect the this this negative curvature, the, the curvature calculation with the over squashing. So because of this theorem that the Olivier curvature is uh, lower bounded by this uh, balanced form on the curvature, because of that, there is a very interesting corollary that's very uh, interesting for this paper. Uh, and the corollary says the following thing. If our curvature is positive for any edge ij, and I, I'm fairly sure that it should, it should state all here because you need to have this condition satisfied for every single edge, which is a very strong condition. But if you have that, then there exists a polynomial P such that, so the, the, the B set of this, of this node I, so the, uh, the R hop uh, receptive field, uh, is gonna be upper bounded by a polynomial in R. And that's super important because we just saw before that if we have, for example, like a binary tree type of, of branching, then we're gonna have exponentially growing uh, receptive field. Whereas here, if the edges are positive, we can have a guarantee that they are bounded by a polynomial. And here we, for the first time, see the connection between oversquashing and uh, curvature. So there is a notion that if your graph is positively curved, then because of this polynomial thingy, indirectly you're going to have uh, less over squashing because you're, you're going to have less bottlenecks and thus uh, less over squashing. Okay, now let's take that one step forward and find an explicit connection between curvature on one hand side and uh, over squashing uh, on the other side. And that's what this theorem four is all about. So this is going to be probably the, 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 main, the main contribution of the paper. Uh, and let me start and dissect this theorem for you. Uh, there is a huge proof in the appendix. You can go and check it out if you're into math, but like this is going to give you a rough intuitive understanding of what's going on here and why this works. So consider uh, a uh, MPNN, so a mass message passing neural network. Uh, so the one we saw in the equation one, that's the generic MPNN. Uh, let I be connected with J and the degree of node I is smaller or equal than DJ. And then assume uh, two conditions. So the first condition assumes that you can basically uh, upper bound the gradient of the uh, update function and the gradient of the psi function of the message function for any layer, for, for any L between uh, zero and capital L minus one, which is L is the number of layers in our MPNN, um, with the depth being at least two layers. 
then they say in two there exists delta such that delta is bounded like this and bounded like this so this is the this um, gamma coefficient we saw a couple of minutes ago and we have that the curvature is uh, upper bounding by upper bounded by minus two plus delta okay so this is so far very like maybe not not that clear i'm gonna give you the gist in a second so then there exists this uh set q sub j which is a subset of s2 set of i satisfying that the size of that set is bigger than one over delta blah blah blah. and for all of these l zeros between zero and capital l minus minus two we have this equation here okay so what this tells us here is that if we sum over elements of that of that subset q of, of s2 and if we if we basically uh, uh, sum up all of these sensitivities of various nodes k from that subset uh, that's going to be upper bounded by this expression here so alpha beta raised to the power of two times delta uh, raised to the power of one over four so now let me let me try and, and visualize this and break it down so first of all we have node i here so let's hit, let's say we have node i here we have one hop neighborhood here and finally we have two hop neighborhood here so what this theorem states is that basically there exists a sub so this is s2 so this this thing here let me try and draw it this thing here is s2 and what they state is that there exists some subset of these nodes so let me just kind of take a subset such that if you were to sum so now take some nodes from from this subset and if we were to calculate their sensitivities they're going to be uh, upper bounded by this expression here so you can also read this as over squashing so over squashing of that neighborhood so the i'm, I'm going to denote that as like over squashing os for example yeah and now what you can see is that if the edge is very negative so if delta goes down to zero if you start in the limit when delta goes to zero this edge ij is going to be very negative because it's going to be upper bounded by minus two plus a small number which means it's going to converge almost to minus two which is super negative edge if that happens that means that this expression here so delta goes to zero here and that means that you can see this becomes the whole expression goes to zero and that means we have over squashing so again the the, the 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 chain of thoughts here is the following if we have negative edges that means that we directly have uh over squashing problem and that's the this direct connection they made um there is a, a lot of details which uh, follow from many other theories there is a lot of maths in the in the appendix but this is uh, roughly what they're they're saying um I'm going to make one more connection here with this Cheeger constant, which is very interesting constant in, in, in graph theory. And then I'm going to show you the final algorithm, the rewiring algorithm they applied in this paper. So back to Cheeger constant. So Cheeger constant intuitively captures the notion of, of how bottlenecked the, the graph is. So if I were to draw a simple graph like this, so let's imagine we have some, some, some nodes inside of here which are densely connected and then we have another community of nodes which are densely connected. And if we have a single edge here, you can see intuitively that this uh, barbell shaped uh, graph has a very high, like a, it's very bottlenecked, like there is a uh, like a huge bottleneck and that's the one here okay and you'll see that this uh, hj so this Cheeger constant correlates with our intuition here very nicely because how we calculate it and there is a mistake here so this should not be here I had a discussion with one of the main authors of the paper Francesco he told me this is just a typo so basically uh, you can see that we, we take the number of elements in this set so this set is as you can see here those are the edges such that i belongs to s and j belongs to its complement so in this particular example that would mean the following so this is if this is s and this is uh, basically the complement uh, then this edge here is going to be a part of this set so this is the only edge that belongs to this set here and that means we have one here so very small number here and then we have uh, like a minimum of volume so, so whatever the minimal volume between these two sets is we find that thing and that we divide it and the volume itself is defined as the sum across all of the nodes of that set s uh, and we just sum up their degrees so you can see here this is going to be like some 
huge number and we have a small number and that means this is going to go towards zero for this uh, edge case of a very bottlenecked uh, graph. And as we start adding, and you can imagine if we start adding more edges, if I were to start more edges here, add more edges, this thing is gonna grow up, so it's gonna explode not explode, but like it's gonna have more and more elements and thus this Cheeger constant is gonna consequently uh, rise up from zero to some uh, bigger number and thus it correlates in a way with how bottlenecked the graph is. And now you can see a bunch of problems. It's a single scalar. What if we had much more communities? What, what if we had like what if we had even more communities here and they are connected? So it fails to, to capture more interesting topologies, but like uh, it's, it's a number that give you, gives you some global, uh, it's, it's a global statistic, some, gives you a global understanding of what's going on in the graph, but it's not that detailed and, 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 and yeah, uh, nuanced. So then they show the following thing, and that's that the uh, basically uh, spec, uh, like sp a spectral gap uh, of, of a graph is bounded by the Cheeger constant. And this spectral graph, uh, gap again correlates with this, uh, how connected the graph is. And what this uh, spectral gap is, and they say it here, uh, so lambda one is the first non-zero eigenvalue of the normalized graph Laplacian, often referred to as spe the spectral gap. So that's a nice connection between spectral theory and, and this uh, graph theory, uh, i.e. The, the Cheeger constant. But more interestingly for us, they show that if the curvature is positive for all of the edges, then you can you can basically uh, like lower bound uh, the Cheeger constant and that and also the, the the spectral gap by this k, which is the same k as we have here. Which means that by controlling the curvature, how positive it is, we can control the 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 uh, Cheeger constant, i.e., how bottleneck the graph is and the spectral gap of the graph. So that's some, some nice connections, not nece necessary to understand this paper, but like I made a small tangent here. Hopefully you can appreciate it. Uh, okay, so finally, let's get to the, to the meat of the, of the paper. I mean, at least procedurally, um, this is the final uh, rewiring algorithm. Uh, before uh, going to the details, let me just tell you what those are. So they say here that more recently there is a trend to decouple the input graph from the graph used for information propagation. So that's an important thing to notice. Such methods are often generically referred to as graph rewiring. And we see here an example. So here on the left hand side, we have the original graph and we have some coloring depending on the curvature. So again, uh, blue means we have negative edges, red means we have positive edges, blah, blah, blah. But more importantly, you can see that if we apply some, some other baseline, and this is called Deagle method. So this is called Deagle, which stands for Diffusion Improves Graph Learning. We can see it completely changes the statistics of this particular graph. It adds a lot of edges and thus completely skews the degree distributions, etc., etc. On the other hand, this thing here is their proposed method, which we're gonna see in a second, and you can see it preserves the statistics, but manages to uh, basically makes the um, curvature of, these, of this graph uh, higher. Okay, now let's see how the actual uh, thing works. And yeah, the important part to notice is that now instead of uh, operating your, your graph neural network on top of this original graph, you instead what you do is you rewire the graph and then you use these edges to do your message passing on your graph. So that's the, that's the, that's the idea behind these uh, rewiring methods. They serve such like some type of, of uh, pre-processing steps. Okay, so here is the stochastic discrete Ricci flow algorithm, which is super fancy name, uh, but it's a very cool algorithm. So let's see what happens here. So we have as input, we have a graph uh, G is given. We have temperature tau, which is a positive temperature, which is because we, we are gonna be sampling uh, in this algorithm. That's why we have the, the notion of temperature. We have max number of iterations and optional, optional curvature upper bound called C plus. We're gonna see what that means in a second. Okay, so the algorithm proceeds as follows. So we're going to repeat the following steps until convergence or the max, max number of iterations has been reached. Let me just draw a, a company uh, graph that's gonna help us grasp this a bit better. So let's say we have two edges here. Uh, let's say they are maybe, uh, a, it's a bridge between some densely connected communities, maybe something like this. And let's see how now the, the graph operates. 
So for edge IJ with minimal Ricci curvature, which is in this example gonna be this one here. So this is gonna be our, our like negative, the most negative edge here. Then they say calculate vector x where the element of that vector x uh, denoted as x sub kl and define like this is basically the improvement to the curvature uh, of this edge ij from adding edge kl where k is belongs to the uh, b1 set of i and l belongs to the b1 set of j. Okay, so let me again uh, just explain what that means. That means we're gonna make the following thing. So let's, um, we're gonna try and add. So uh, we're gonna try and add an edge. So basically here maybe. And this one you can see, so this is node i, this is node j. You can see that I took a node from the b1 set of i and I connected it with, with, a, with a, a node from b1 set of j. Uh, and now I see how, how, how much of an improvement does this uh, have on, on the curvature of this edge? And that's this term here, okay? So we're basically gonna do the same thing. So we're gonna do this multiple times and we're gonna exhaustively connect uh, this one with this one and, and, and uh, this one with this one, etc., etc. And we're gonna calculate this improvement for all of those. And then we're gonna sample with probability, uh, basically softmax, of that vector x and we use tau to modulate the temperature and we're gonna sample from that vector and then edge, add the edge uh, that was sampled to the graph. So maybe one of these edges is gonna be sampled, maybe, I don't know, maybe this one is gonna be chosen and uh, basically that will be the end of step one. You can imagine that if you push tau to like positive infinity to some big number, a big positive number, then you're gonna have, instead of, of this uh, like smooth distribution, you're gonna have like a deterministic distribu distribution where the edge that had the highest uh, improvement is gonna be chosen, sampled, and added to the graph. So you can kind of use tau to um, tweak your, your algorithm in that sense. Okay, so we've added the edge and that, that increased uh, the positivity of this uh, initial uh, curved edge uh, denoted in blue. And the second step is remove edge with maximal uh, Ricci curvature only if that curvature is bigger than this C plus. So that's the upper bound I mentioned. And again, you have some control here. If you make C plus arbitrary, like very, very big, then at one point of time, uh, that will mean that we'll, you'll never be uh, removing positive edges and you'll just be adding uh, these edges that increase the positivity of the of the graph. Okay, so the reason why they have this part here is in order to preserve the statistics of the graph. So as much as you add and thus increase the number of edges, you want to also remove and uh, thus kind of balance out uh, the, the 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 number of edges and the degree of nodes are going to be uh, less skewed in that way. Uh, in that way. Cool, uh, and you do this until convergence. Well, and whereas convergence means sometimes whatever combination of edges you add, you'll never have the improvement here, and thus that's that's how convergence is defined. And that's that's it. That's the that's the uh, stochastic uh, discrete Ricci flow algorithm. Uh, fairly simple idea. Uh, if you think about it, very very neat because it has this awesome connection with uh, differential geometry. But uh, but yeah, okay. So finally, they do compare. Uh, how STRF works compared to Deagle, which is this competitive approach, which works much better on homophilic uh, graphs. But I'm gonna skip this math and theorems because it's a, it's a, arguably a, a tangent, not, uh, not necessary to understand the core of this paper. And so I'm gonna skip that part uh, this time. So here are the results you can see uh, on various different um, graph data sets. Uh, Quora sites here, PubMed might be familiar to most of you who have who have had any exposure to GraphML field. Uh, you can see we have uh, the homophily coefficient associated with each of these graph data sets as denoted by this uh, add h uh, of j. And you can see these ones have low h, which means low homophily, which means high heterophily. And these ones are much more homophilic. And again, homophily just means uh, birds of feather flock together, i.e. if you have a node and it's connected to its neighboring nodes, there is a high uh, chance that basically they'll share the same label. Whereas in heterophilic datasets, oftentimes very distant nodes, so some nodes which are 
uh, yeah, more distant from each other, are gonna have the same label and gonna share the label. <clears throat> and you can imagine for these heterophilic data sets, it's very important to have effective strategy of communicating over those long distances and over squashing is one of the things that's gonna uh, ruin that communication and that's what this paper is handling basically and that's why it's better for heterophilic data sets compared to homophilic data sets. Uh, the results support the claim. You can see that for these heterophilic data sets, it basically outperforms all of the other baselines. We have Deagle here, we have this uh, plus FA approach, which is uh, basically just fully a full um, adjacency matrix uh, in the last layer of a graph neural network, a very simple modification that kind of tries to cope with over squashing effect as well. Uh, and yeah, as, as I said, better performance on these heterophilic data sets, and you can see not as great, although competitive performance on, on these uh, homophilic data sets. Deagle seems to perform somewhat better uh, compared to, to SDRF, which is expected. Okay, so uh, finally, just some distributions. Here they show that their rewiring method is much uh, better at preserving various statistics. So, so you can see here that uh, comparing the degree distributions, you can see that the, the, the blue one is the original one, uh, the green one is the uh, STRF, and Deagle is the orange one, and you can see it completely changes the, the degree distributions for various different data sets. And also you can see that uh, the number of edges that Deagle adds is huge, whereas it, it does not remove edges. And on the other hand, STRF both adds and removes edges, and that's why it preserves the st statistics of the graph. Finally, I'm gonna uh, end it up on this note. Uh, they mentioned the limitation, which is very something to think about. Uh, so one limitation of our work is that the theoretical results presented here do not currently extend to multigraphs. Okay, that's one thing because uh, this whole like thing of calculating the number of triangles, four cycles, all of that breaks down uh, in the case of multigraphs, where you can have multiple edges between nodes. And finally, they say even more importantly that in addition, the current methodology is agnostic to information beyond the graph topology, such as node features. So why is that important? So imagine you have a graph where, for example, like a social media graph, and that graph represents who is following whom. And if you were to start and just, um, based on the curvature of the edges, start rewiring that, you're changing the underlying semantics of the social media graph, and that can lead to false predictions later in your pipeline. So because you're not taking features, node features and net features into account, you're less nuanced in how you change the semantics of the underlying graph, if that makes sense. Okay, so on that note, um, this is a very, very cool paper. I loved it. And uh, if you found the, the video useful yourself, uh, consider sharing the video um, and subscribe to this channel. And finally, uh, do join our Discord community. You'll check, uh, you can find the links down in the description. Until next time, bye-bye.